of Life Under Deborah's Palm, where today we're going to take a look at assisted living, how to find one, what to look for, questions to ask. Stay tuned. And of course, if you like this channel and you get something out of it, please like, subscribe, share, hit that notification bell so you can watch things when they come up. Just so you know, this is going to be a longer than usual video. I try to keep them around 15 or 20 minutes, but this, there's a lot of information that I didn't want to split into two videos because we're talking about moving somebody into assisted living and there's just a lot of things you need to know. So on that note, you should probably get a pen and paper and a beverage of choice and get ready to watch this one. The first thing I'm going to tell you about assisted living is to consider your own fears and take a look at what are you afraid of putting them in. I, you know, people are, say, I don't want to do it. I don't want to put my loved one in. Understandable. No one really wants to be put in. No one wants to go there. But realistically, what are you afraid of? Is it abuse and neglect? Those things can be found out. You can look that up online if um, the facility that you're looking at has any sort of state complaints and what happened. And I think a lot of it is, you know, I think we feel guilty like we just couldn't do it and maybe we should have been able to do it. It's dementia. It's totally different than any other disease. So, you know, there comes a point where for some of us, we just don't have much of a choice. So, here's what we need to look for. The first thing you need to know is their financial situation. How much do they take in every month? And what do they have in, when you apply for assisted living, the business office is gonna ask you all these questions and you're gonna have to supply everything. So, they might make $3,000 a month and it may cost 6,000 or more for an assisted living facility. Now. They're not going to go private pay and I'm going to tell you if you can't hit the private pay price every month with what they take in for social security or retirement or whatever, don't go there. You won't be there long and a lot of them will tell you that anyways. They'll just ask you right on the phone how much do they make, how much do they have. Like some of them really, we have one around here that if you don't make something like $10,000 a month and have $300,000 in the bank they won't even let you tour so most people i believe were like us where they end up private pay to medicaid and in our city there is literally one facility that is memory care that is private pay and medicaid thankfully it's a decent one otherwise i don't know what any of us would do so once you find that out, you might find it's a pretty narrow search. You are going to call them up. They'll schedule you for a tour. COVID is making things crazy, but in general, you will go for a tour. Normally what they were doing in the facility that my mom's at is they were actually asking the resident to come for a two hour visit. Thankfully, my mom didn't have to do that because she would have freaked. Truly, she would have freaked. Um, COVID kind of ended that for her. And we had already had people there. So for us, it was no big deal. As far as the money goes and the private pay to Medicaid, or if you're already on Medicaid, it's different. But the we have found with bigger groups, like the place that we're at is probably the biggest group. It's definitely the biggest group in the city that we live in. They have a really good business office. And they can ex they explained everything. Here's what you have. Here's when Medicaid will kick in. They actually give you a whole printout of all the stuff, um, the financial stuff. And then they would say at approximately this date, your loved one will hit Medicaid and they transfer them over. They don't move. They don't do anything. It's just a paper flip, basically. But you'll want to know that because while they're on private pay, there are things you will be responsible for paying for, such as depends. If they need those, you will have to provide them and you will have to bring them to the facility. Don't believe that you can't afford a place. Uh, the business office should be able to explain all that to you. If they're a good business office, they will explain how Medicaid works, how pooled trust works, all that stuff. So if you look on the Medicaid website and it says, 
that you have to have these minimums and maximums and all that stuff, don't freak out because you're not really understanding the way that it works. And I have another video that I quickly explain how that works and there are people who can help you plan for that. But you will qualify. Even if you make too much, there are trusts, they're called pooled trusts, and they'll let you put your money in that. So don't think that you can't get in and you can't qualify and you need a really good business office person to help you out with that. So now you've got your tour and you go in the door and here's the things you want to just kind of look for in general. Is the place clean? How does the place smell? That can be a little funny because if somebody just had a blowout in the common area, you might be picking that up. But in general, the whole place should not stink. How are they going to handle their medical issues? Is there always a nurse on staff? There should be somebody 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Usually there is. I know we went through a period back, a while back where they had what's called a charge aid and didn't matter. They could find somebody in a heartbeat. Someone was always on call. I think some of those things are changing. So you might want to know that and how comfortable you are with that as well as you're going to come in and you are going to have your loved one's set of doctors. That's fine, you can keep them. If you do that, you will be responsible for taking them to all the doctor's appointments, the dentist's appointments, whatever you have. And here's the kicker though, you need to find this out because if you keep their doctors, you will be responsible 24 seven. So for example, if your loved one gets what seems like, I don't know, a cold or bronchitis or whatever, they're going to call you and you're going to have to go and you're going to have to get an appointment and you're going to have to get one pretty darn quick and get them checked out. We signed our loved ones over to the care of the facility, which has a fantastic physician's assistant who has been there for years, who they deal with all that. They deal with all their prescriptions, all their medications. They, they took care of it and we did not have to drop everything and run. We were perfectly fine with that. They did a good job. If they do need an outside specialist, you know, we, we had to take my mother to an orthopedic guy once in a while and we had to do things like take them to the dentist, but we did not have to take any, anywhere for like the stomach bug or anything like that. So you really will want to know that if that's an option and you may not want the option, but you may find out you do want the option. When we first started this journey, we put um, my in-laws into a place that was private pay and affordable for them. They could pay every month and it didn't really cut into any of their savings. And when we toured and talked to the facility, the person who told us how everything worked assured us that they could take care of my in-laws. Um, my mother-in-law was in an earlier stage and you will find that Assisted living that is not memory care can take care of dementia in the early stages, but they're going to have to move at some point. So that's up to you how you want to do that. But what happened to us was we were told they could handle them. My father-in-law was fairly advanced and I made that very clear. Nope, nope, sure, no, no problem. We'll deal with it, the whole thing. Well, we got lied to. They could not deal with it. They had severe problems with the facility. They cleaned house, a new woman took over. They basically fired everybody. And what we found out was the person that we toured with that told us, oh yeah, we can do it, we can whatever, worked on commission and they had to have a certain percentage of their beds filled. And he lied. And when he lied to us, what happened was we had to get one of those care people, they're basically, they're sitters for lack of a better word, was $24 an hour, 24 hours a day. We paid that for about a week or a week and a half until we got them into memory care facility. Thank God we got them in quick because we didn't have any other options. But be warned, there are people working on commission who are unethical. While they were in that place, what happened was we were responsible for all their doctor appointments, everything. So I had a caseworker in the new place in the memory care facility tell me a story 
that she once worked in a private pay place like we had just come out of. And in that place, she said on Christmas Eve one year, 23 residents got the stomach bug all at once. She sent all 23 of them to the ER on Christmas Eve. You have to go to the ER with your loved ones. So you really will, might want to consider whether or not you want to sign things over. And if you go into a facility initially in the early stages, that could happen to you. That's how they work. It's, it's a totally different animal. So we signed all our medical stuff over and they did a great job. And they're on call all the time. That being said, you need to know what kind of care medically. So does your loved one have diabetes, for example? Um, because if they need constant blood monitoring where you stick your finger and do the glucose test, I know where my family is. They did not do that. They, that's actually considered like a nursing home type thing or someplace else besides them. It was no big deal if you had like type 2 diabetes, but if you had type 1 where you really needed to be monitored all the time, you're going to want to make sure they can handle something like that because they may not be able to. Um, type 2 was, was all oral medication and that was not a problem for them, but I don't know how it would work if they actually had an insulin injection. So if you're dealing with some of that stuff where you know that they need something monitored all the time or frequently through the day, you will definitely want to ask the question if they can handle that or not. In fact, you might want to ask on the phone before you even get there. Check out the staff. Some of them are nurses, some of them are aides. How are they doing? How are they interacting with the residents? Now, don't freak out if you see aides sitting in a common area watching TV. They will likely have residents with them or the residents will all be in a recreation room doing something else. But don't freak out if you see that. Likewise, do not freak out if you see people at residents that are like sound asleep in a chair somewhere. That is the progression of the disease and they are not hurting anybody and it's not a big deal. They are not in harm's way. They simply let them sleep. That is normal. You will find that pretty much anywhere. So don't get all stressed out thinking like something weird's going on with that. So one of the other things you really want to ask them is how often is my loved one checked on? And in the facility that my mom is in, the answer is every two hours, 24 hours a day. So in the middle of the night, every two hours, they pop the door open and just, just to make sure they haven't fallen or something hasn't, you know, drastic has gone on. But even during the day, they're not forced to go to activities and maybe they want to hang out in their room. Same thing. They should be checked on at a certain interval. And you'll, you'll really want to know that. That's really a safety issue. Also on the medical end, I would ask about the caseworkers. Everybody's going to have a case manager. Uh, are they nurses? Are they social workers? It, it can be either. It can be both. It just depends on how they do it. How big is their caseload? So at the facility we're at, our case manager handles that floor, which is probably 48 to maybe 52 people, something like that. Things that will make them take an ambulance ride. Complaining of chest pains or a fall, obviously, if they think they've literally hurt or broken something. But if they have somewhere fallen and they bump their head or they think they bumped their head or they could have bumped their head, all those things will get them an ambulance ride to the ER. It is just guaranteed. That's how it goes. You might want to know that or ask specifics when you visit. Take a look at how the dining room is, how meals are served. I've toured places where they are literally a giant cafeteria. Uh, my in-laws first place was a dining room, but it was quiet. It was kind of like a wait staff. It was actually pretty nice for the size of it. But in memory care, um, we really like it. It is very small. It is there's approximately 12 people that dine in that area. So that the aides right there 
checking on them, making sure they have their food. They monitor uh, what they eat, how much they eat. And you need to know that because they really are required to keep track of what they eat. They should be weighing them once a month to see if they're gaining or losing weight. How secure is the place? So obviously dementia people can wander and, and I say wander. They just walk out the door or maybe they might be having a fit that day saying they're going home. All the exterior doors should have an alarm and a lock on them that they cannot get out. Um, usually the exterior doors have some kind of keypad, whether it's a punch code or something, so that residents cannot exit the building. The stairwells should also have them. If they are in a multi-floor building, make sure that they have alarms on the stairs. You don't want them trip and falling or just going out there falling asleep somewhere. So those things are definitely something you want to check into. Check out the recreation portion of it. Usually they will give you a calendar and I'm going to show you kind of, let me cover everybody's names and stuff, but you'll see every single day of the month is filled and it's filled with all sorts of stuff. Um, walking clubs, chair exercises, bingo, uh, movies, trivia, ice cream socials, afternoon tea, blah, blah, blah. And right now, some of it's a little lax. They used to have a lot of music people come in and entertain, but COVID has kind of slowed that stuff down now. Hopefully it'll be picking back up, but um, they have a lot of stuff to do. There's always something going on and know that they will not force your loved ones into activities. They will, they should be strongly encouraging them, inviting them, knocking on the door. And you need to ask that question where the, like I said, if they just don't want to go, they don't want to go. It's not their thing. Maybe they're not feeling great that day, but the staff should be encouraging. And so you need to ask, what would you do to encourage my loved one to go to whatever activity and in a good place they'll ask you is there something they like to do are they into sewing or cooking or whatever and then they will also kind of make sure that when those activities come up that they'll really try to get encourage them and get them moving the place we were at had a uh, has an activity director when they find out what they like and where they're at they actually try to pair them up with somebody similar so they kind of make friends as well Good questions to ask. You don't want them sitting around doing nothing. If they were doing that, they'd do that at your house. Also in the activities end of things, this has changed with COVID as well and hopefully it will change back here as we move along, but they had outside activities. They are, the place that we were at, they actually would take them bowling if they were capable, but they would take them out to see Christmas lights. They would take them for fall rides. They actually had a diner that would accommodate them and they would take them to the diner. That was extra and we had a fund, like there's a business part of it where you can leave like a hundred bucks that they will just deduct from. Same thing with the hair salons, it, that might be real helpful. Most places do have somebody who comes in and cuts usually once a week or whatever the schedule is. Same thing, that was extra, but we left the money on account and the hair salon people just deducted it off the account. And we could say, we want a cut and a perm or whatever we want every six weeks that she's to get a you know haircut, hairstyle, whatever. So you might want to ask, see if they have a salon. You can always take them out. It doesn't matter. But sometimes there are things that, especially as the disease progresses and it gets harder for them to go out, you'll want in place. And the obvious thing is what services do they offer? And they should be doing medication, bathing, laundry, cleaning, all that stuff. Now, things to keep in mind. First of all, Medication, if you are still private pay and if you have an older parent, they're on Medicare anyways, and what that covers because you still may be paying portions of their medicine and, and what happens if they suddenly need an emergency prescription like they get an infection and they need um, antibiotics. There's usually a company that will deliver in 24 hours and they'll just bill you. The, the facility would no, I'm sorry. The people who brought the medicine would um, bill us personally. 
Things like laundry and clothes, okay. They're gonna wanna not change their clothes. They're gonna wanna wear the same clothes every day. And you will want to know how they're gonna handle that. What happens with us is when they get to that point, they take their clothes and they keep them in the laundry room and in the morning they bring them a new set of clothes. So they can't just keep putting the same one on. They may still fight with them. They may still wanna get the same clothes on. These things happen, you know, I'm going to tell you right now, this you really need to understand this very clearly. They're in assisted living, they are not in a nursing home. There is a difference. So in assisted living, they will not force them and they cannot force them to take a shower, to change their clothes, to brush their teeth, to wash their hands, whatever. They can't force them. Now they will do their best. They will work with them. If you know um, tips and tricks that will kind of help them, you know, work with the staff, really. Do your best to work with them, not against them. You'll get a lot farther. They're gonna have some of the same struggles you have had. Uh, my husband was really good at getting his mother to take a shower where the staff was just struggling with her. He would get an aide on standby and he would go, he would just tell her whatever he told her and she would hop in the shower and he would just, the aide would come right in and, and deal with it. I'm gonna tell you this too, aides, yeah, it's gonna happen. You're gonna get a crappy one somewhere. That's just how it goes. But if we're all really honest, we've all been in the workforce somewhere in our life and we've all worked with crappy coworkers somewhere who just sucked at their job. It will probably happen. Calm down, don't get nasty. Very nicely, tell somebody what happened, explain the situation. In the 10 years we've dealt with this place, I think I've had one complaint and it was years into it. And so the person who dealt with it said, I knew when you complained something was really wrong because you guys never complain. So you really need to understand what assisted living can and cannot do um, you're going to need to understand this as well. Ask them why they cannot stay in assisted living. There will come a point where the disease will progress to the place where they're going to have to move to a nursing home. You want to know what that is. Some of them, there's several reasons, but some of the most common are number one, it's called the inability to transfer. And the inability to transfer just means that they can't get up out of a chair or a couch without somebody helping them. Now you'll see everything has arms. They'll even put the things on the toilet so they can push up. But if they get to the point where they can't anymore and they need help all the time, that's beyond the scope of what assisted living can do. And some of these are state mandated laws and they will put them in a nursing home. They can no longer feed themselves. Some places, you need to check, some places will do that in assisted living. Some places will not do that. This is gonna sound really gross, what I'm about to say, but they play with the contents of their diaper and they make artwork on the wall. It happens, they can't stay. Um, and, and there's a long list, but you'll need to know that just so you can get yourself ready. And usually they're pretty good about letting you know, or our experience has been, hopefully, this is why you're gonna ask a bunch of questions and grill people. And, you know, I wouldn't be afraid if they said, hey, we're going to put you on this floor and your caseworker is so-and-so. Hi, I'd like to speak with so-and-so before I move and get a feel for your caseworker and make sure you feel like there's a good fit, you know? You're paying a lot of money and you want to make sure that everyone is taken care of well to, you know, the best that they can do. I hope that helps. I know it's a lot of information, but it's also a big decision and there's a lot of things that go on and I'm sure there are things I missed in this, but that that's really the major points. And no matter how much homework you do and, and research you do, you know, there's still things you won't think of and things that'll happen, but this is a pretty extensive list of things to look for and things to make sure that you understand about assisted living versus a nursing home. So, have a great day.